Hi everybody, I'm Bree the Plant Lady, checking in with another micro garden tour installation, starting out here in my roadside bed. I don't give this section like any care at all. It doesn't get irrigated. Um, I, usually it's the open gardens that are the motivation for even walking out here. And I gotta say, last year I did some um, very intentional planting of perennials to fill up open space. And it's looking great this year with literally no care at all. So let me turn the camera around so you can see better what's been planted in here and how everything is doing. Well, we'll start with this big corner of bright eyes, uh, panicle flocks. And across the front here is a type of dwarf crepe myrtle that is totally doing what it's supposed to do. And the bright chartreuse is tiger eyes sumac, which is sort of a running woody. See the original plant is in here. And I've just put out like a hundred billion uh, Silene cornarium seed, which is great because I want that to just sort of colonize this sunny corner. I have to say, I really like the phlox and the sumac together. Because we've got a hedicium randomly poking out of that Hollywood juniper that I would like to cut down, which I think I will cut down. And one of the things I did in the winter of 2021 was transplant a bunch of sedum and pycnanthemum into this bed in an attempt to make it so I don't have to mulch so much space. And you can see the pycnanthemum is doing really well, filling in that sort of shady gap. And this sedum camshaticum is doing great. I still have some open areas that I need to come in strategically with some more plants. I could probably just plant more flocks and it would fill in that gap and be a service to the pollinators. I think I'm gonna take I'm going to cut this viburnum all the way down. It's just not drought tolerant for this part of the garden. And of course, the Lespedeza little volcano is great, and that'll be flowering soon. And the Deutzia is beautiful when it blooms in May. And this crepe myrtle, it's here. I did not plant it, but I'm not ambitious enough to get rid of it. But you can see how well the phlox just kind of fills in the gaps, even in the shade. So I think just a little more flocks spread throughout this bed will make it extra interesting and inviting to everybody who passes by. Because this is the view from the street. Actually, specifically, this is the view from the street. But it's a nice border. And of course, that live oak right here and right there flanking the driveway are two of my favorite trees. They're so stately. And I can't believe how much they've grown in the decade that they have been planted. These did get planted as 50 gallon, but they are enormous compared to what they looked like when they got installed. So as we continue around here, you can see this is the only living lavender, <laughs> but it has persisted. This is platinum blonde, I think, and more of that sedum that I planted I have like hibiscus and stuff, but it's too dry out here and probably too shady. The Lespedeza really fills in quite efficiently. Same thing with the Rudbeckia. And I think that's actually a miscanthus. Um, the knockout roses are really underperforming. I don't like knockout roses that much. I'm probably not ambitious enough to fully get rid of it, but I'd like to cut it to the ground. Cause I mean, look at it. It's not pretty. It doesn't have rose rosette, but it's ugly as sin. And it's thorny. I just don't like thorny plants. This one's doing better. At least it's flowering. But I mean, look at those thorns. It's absolutely vicious. Ugh. Ugh. It does not motivate me to, to play around with it at all. So overall, I think this bed Considering it's gotten zero maintenance, it's doing really well. And then as we pan to this shady part of the wave, you can see that live oak is even bigger. And it was planted at the same time as the ones by the driveway. 
So it's like, I think it's tapped into a, a, a spring or something. But at the base of that, um, I have a lot of carrot that I had direct seeded. And the great thing about that is, first of all, carrots are, they're really quite pretty. They have like nice ferny foliage, but the swallowtail caterpillars have been in here munching down. You can see where they've eaten you know, whole, whole leaves off. I'm looking for some, I saw them earlier today. <sighs> Put on my swallowtail eyes. There we go, here's one. So see, that's just munching on the flower. And that, to me, this is the real reason to grow carrots. Like I love their flowers. I love eating their roots. But at the end of the day, if it supports swallowtail activity, that's my main motivator. Here's another one. When I was out here a few days ago, there were like 80. It was crazy. And all this is is just scattering carrot seed. So what does carrot seed look like? Oh, I just happen to have some flowers on me. So this is what they look like when you let them flower, bolt, go to seed. They dry up completely. You see they have a tap root, just like a carrot. And now you can literally just take the seeds right off of these seed heads and sprinkle them right onto the ground. It's literally that easy. So if you've not done this before, make this the year that you scatter some carrot seeds around, if for no other reason, to support the swallowtail butterflies in their caterpillar stage. So as we go across here and get into more sun, you see uh, zinnias growing. Those are all self-sown. And the carrots are getting larger and larger. Of course, there's nut sedge, because how could there not be? Um, and now I'm really excited that a couple of the pumpkins are starting to take off. And I think this is gonna look really cool for the open garden on Saturday, September 24th from noon to 4 p.m. Um, who doesn't like a pumpkin patch? And especially a pumpkin patch where the foliage is so pretty. Now there probably won't be a lot of pumpkins by that time in September, but there might be a couple. Uh, but at least the foliage I think is gonna be really tropical and beautiful. And of course, Ava Grace, the little babe, she also approves. She likes to wander into the pumpkin patch. But you can see it's got a really long vine and even though I've got a fairly open space here, I think between this side that I can start wrapping and training back, um, I'm gonna have full coverage and it'll look awesome. So just like the front roadside border, these culvert, driveway culvert beds have to be really self-sustaining. And I think we've successfully achieved that. It's the only place that I can keep Mullenbergia alive. Everywhere else it dies from being too wet. So driveway adjacency is good. Um, Eucomus do really well. This is Diamond Dazzle, Crepe Myrtle. So I really like, um, I haven't had to do anything to that. It's been planted 11 years. And more carrots at the base, just a carrot ground cover essentially with some Lunaria over here and some Phlox subulata wrapping around this side. Kind of the same planting in that bed and out in the driveway or out in the mailbox. Um, I actually did cut that crepe myrtle down about six weeks ago. And you can see it's already growing back but it's like a nice, small, manageable size. Like it had gotten so big, it was like eating the entire mailbox. But look at it now. You gotta love a plant that you can just cut back to the ground. And funny enough, at the base of that, it's a peanut. And over here, some crimson clover. And of course, some buckwheat. So it wouldn't be Bree's yard if there wasn't buckwheat at the mailbox. So on this side property border, again, a big old live oak, creating a lot of shade, helping make it very dry. But all the plants are holding on, very little irrigation. Eucomus, I really like the Eucomus and the Carex mixed together. 
Um, I haven't been able to get flocks established very well in this bed. Um, I think it might just be that it's too dry. I really don't irrigate this bed very often. So the plants that are in here have to like to live and that Adina rubella uh, does really well. And of course there's a, a rose at the base and some native Baptisia, Nefafia, Ginkgo, Calicarpa. This is actually Calicarpa acuminata which colors up really late, but it gets the most amazing, super dark purple berries. The main ground cover in this bed are perennial, different colors of perennial chrysanthemums. I really like chrysanthemum. I like it just sort of like I like phlox. It just meanders through and fills up space. And that is always flowering late October. You can see there's quite a bit of it. It's pretty much a solid ground cover along the edges. I cut this viburnum bituensi back pretty hard. Um, I didn't have the right tools. Some of these should have been cut down longer or lower to the ground. And some of these just, I probably need to come back in and, and do a little more work on this to decide whether I want it to grow as a tree or just coppice it back to grow shrub form. Shrub form probably makes more sense. Here we have Calicarpa Americana, Welch's Pink. And you see, this is one of the very first to color up. This is usually in full pink by the end of August, early September. You can see these are really starting to get color. Most of the other Calicarpa in here will be at least six weeks out before any berries really start to show off. Um, this, this is a collection of Calicarpa. Um, that's Calicarpa quantigenensis. And this is Americana Alba. And this is Calicarpa Japonica. I'm gonna have to look this one up. But the base over here is the large kind of mother plant of that Buxus um, Unraveled that I showed you in a former video in the backyard. I have it basically growing as an edge. The great thing about boxwoods, animals don't like it. So anything you have planted behind it is relatively safe. Same thing with the Helleborus fetidus, the stinking hellebore. I do cut the flowers off of this so they don't self-sow because I'm worried about their invasiveness. Um, but overall, it's a, a great plant. It's growing here at the base of a water oak. This is a super dry, dry, dry place. And you can see that hellebore is doing really well. Pieris, actually some nandina that don't flower so they don't set fruit. I'm not a huge nandina fan, but these have done well. Uh, some distillium, they don't maybe like the dryness as much, but you can see this um, beautiful oak leaf hydrangea from first editions plant line has not skipped a beat and it's not so big, it's the perfect scale. So I'm really, really impressed with that plant. But you see there's distillium all the way around and they're a little off color, but they're certainly gonna survive. And that's sort of what matters in a super hot, dry place. Well, the final stop on our micro tour is the front foundation bed that I am just really, really happy with. You know, every year this bed, I challenge myself to make it different and have a totally different theme. And this year, solidarity with the Ukraine was at the top of my list. So I wanted to have a lot of sunflowers in here so that every day I would think of Ukraine and send good positive vibes. And it sounds stupid, but I don't know how else to help really. Um, I wanted to also make it a foodscape, but make it a pollinator heaven. And without mixing too many different things in, which would make it look really, really chaotic. Like this is a bit chaotic, but it still reads as purposeful because there's blocks of plants. So did um, buckwheat direct seeded the middle of June when we installed this um, right along edges. This buckwheat got really big. So buckwheat in enriched soil like this would be better to be in more the middle versus you see how it's growing over the sidewalk and kind of collapsing and making a mess. This incredible yellow sunflower is hands down 
the most remarkable new plant to hit the market. They, there's just no comparing. It's so incredible. You have to grow it. It's not a pollinator magnet. Like there are plenty of bees and other insects that visit it. Like, look, this one's covered in ants. But as far as like butterflies, it's, I haven't really seen any butterfly activity on it because they prefer the zinnias and the phlox. Um, but that's okay. Um, I don't think that it sets viable seed, uh, which is also fine. Um, I'm a seed collector, but yeah, none of this feels like it's real. It's not. So it's, it's, it's definitely been bred to be sterile so that you buy it again, but it is worth buying period. And I really want to grow Venus next year. That That's the variety that has like a, wait, is, it's Saturn. Sorry, Saturn, not Venus. Um, it has like an orange ring around the base. So I'm also pleased with the kind of random smattering of castor beans. They did that themselves. Uh, when we planted this, we pulled all the castor bean seedlings out and these have germinated since the middle of June. Probably the plant I'm most excited about though in this border is the sesame. I'm just fascinated by sesame. It hit me like a ton of bricks about five years ago when I was at Monticello. I'd never even thought about sesame before and now I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> it's, but you see it's blooming. Um, it, it is great for pollinators. Um, here's the seed. Those are not ripe yet, but that's how the seed capsules form. And, you know, some caterpillars get on it. That's caterpillar frass. So there's a caterpillar somewhere. You can see it's been eating the leaves. But I don't, I mean, that doesn't matter. I want to have all stages of insects to have a healthy ecosystem. So some, some holes in the leaves don't bother me one bit. Um, there is sweet potato growing in here. I, I, it's, it's so shaded out, I can't imagine that I'm going to have good tuber production, but you never know. Um, some areas have better, better sweet potato presence than others. But I really love looking out from my spot on the couch, um, out to this border. David's been parking his bike here. It makes me feel like we're in the Netherlands, having a bike just right outside in the garden. And um, I love this view and I love seeing all the pollinator activity. It's really motivating and brings me a lot of joy, especially this summer when I've spent so much of my time on that couch as I um, battled COVID. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed this series of micro tours and um, that what I've done here will inspire you and maybe give you some ideas of what to do or what not to do. Either way, there's always something to learn from every experience, right? Well, I appreciate all of you watching these videos and I look forward to giving more updates as the garden continues to evolve. And I hope all of you will enjoy these last couple of weeks of August. Maybe you'll get in some good beach trips or some uh, late summer adventures. Take care, everybody, and thanks so much for watching.